Okay. People will probably keep joining as we get started, but we can go ahead and start. So hi everyone, my name is Carissa Inglert and I'm an AmeriCorps member serving Conservation Nebraska's Common Ground Program. I just wanna thank you so much for being here and attending our native landscaping webinar that we have for you tonight. We hope to learn more about savanna, woodland and prairie plants. And just a couple of reminders before we get started, everyone is muted and your cameras are off so you can't be seen or heard. So um, don't worry about that. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box and we'll go over them at the end or Bob mentioned that he might just answer them as we're going. So that could happen as well. Um, the webinar is being recorded. So if you miss anything, it will be posted to our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. And Bob also mentioned that his PowerPoint will be available to you in a couple of weeks as well if we don't end up getting through all of it because he has a lot of good information for us tonight. Um, lastly, there will be a short poll that will pop up on your screen with a couple of questions at the end. And these will help Conservation Nebraska just to improve our future webinars and our events. And Last but not least, here today with us is Bob Hendrickson, and Bob is going to share a little bit about himself and his work, and then we will get started with the webinar. So now we'll hand things off to the expert, Bob, to get us started. Oh no, the expert, oh no. <laughs> hey, that's the thing with plants. Hey, everybody, thank you for, for joining us this evening. That's the that's beauty of plants. If you're a plant person, which you probably are, otherwise you wouldn't be turning in tonight, right? Uh, with the beauty of, of plants and uh, horticulture is you'll never be done. So it's a lifelong learning and you'll never know it all. And I, I find that as to me, that's what, really what turns me on with the whole thing is like, I like learning and hopefully you do as well. And man, with this ongoing drought that we're having, I was actually working at a fellow's place um, after work. I do side jobs and I was I had my trusty dandelion digger and dandelions wilting in the landscape from lack of rain. What? In late May? Go figure. Uh, so the beauty of prairie plants and hopefully while you're tuning in is I want to make a difference. And why do I make a difference with prairie plants? And for me, it's more resilient landscaping, uh, landscaping that can that can withstand uh, extreme drought. And that's what we're in right now in Lancaster County and, you know, the panhandle and South Central Nebraska has had more rain this spring than we have, right? And so it's been a pretty brutal day, high of 95 in Lincoln, right? It's just bleh. And so we knew the 90s were coming, but it reared its ugly head today. So uh, yeah, so uh, hopefully uh, if you haven't already started gardening using native plants, um, hopefully this will inspire you to, to do so. And with me, with native plants, the way I view native plants is uh, I'm not a native. So uh, concrete's not native, asphalt's not native. Last time I checked, our turf grass is not native. Our love affair with the turf grass lawn, um, you know, and corn and soybeans, right? So I'm, I'm not a native purist in that sense, meaning it has to be native. It has to be, you know, a local ecotype from Nebraska because, you know, any plant is a good plant. It's better than all those things I just mentioned. So don't uh, chastise those that are gardening with things like hydrangeas or hostas or things like that. It is what it is. Whatever gets people into gardening in my book is a good thing. So native plants, um, just uh, we don't have enough of them out there in gardens. If I had my way, I'd drive home this evening after this talk and everybody would have a native plant garden in their yard. So with that being said, um, feel free to ask any questions in the chat. I'll try to answer them as we go. Um, any comments, whatever. Uh, maybe I talk about a plant. I think it's always good for others to chime in about that plant. So if you're a native plant gardener and you're familiar with that plant, you know, put it in the comments, put it in the chat and say, oh, this is an awesome plant, people. You have to have it, have to get it. It's easy and dependable. So with that, I, should I go ahead and share my screen so you don't go have ahead. to look at my face anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I think this is the one. There we go. All right. Can everybody see that okay? Whoopsie. I didn't want to do that yet. Okay. Very good. Well, I will go ahead and get started then, and uh, we will go we will go ahead and do that. Let me go ahead and click on the participants and see who I can see is all here. So I recognize some names. 
All right. Well, a lot of new names to me out there. Okay. I see one. Gail. Hi. How you doing? Uh, oh, boy. Uh, let's see. Joanne's even tuned in. Joanne, if you want to talk about a butterfly or three, by all means, especially if it's a larval host plant. Um, people don't know enough about everybody knows the milkweed and the monarch, but uh, few people know anything beyond that uh, as a larval food host uh, with the prairie plant. So Please uh, chime in, Margo. How you doing? And Mark's here too. All right, great stuff, Megan. All right, great. All right, I'll quit saying that. <laughs> well, welcome aboard, everybody. All right, uh, hopefully you know what this plant is uh, with my start out slide. This is a keystone species in Nebraska prairies. If you see this in a prairie, uh, chances are it's never been plowed before. And this is lead plant you're looking at. And, um, you know, in Nebraska, in the eastern part of the state, we have one tenth of one percent of the original tall grass prairie. All the other parts of that tall grass prairie have been plowed under. So one tenth of one percent. So think about that. If we only go with seed collected from local ecotype, in my opinion, that's a pretty small gene pool to be uh, scattering around our state. This uh, picture that you see here was taken uh, near in uh, Morton Arboretum. So if you haven't been to the Morton Arboretum outside of Chicago, um, man, put that on your to-do list to visit the Morton Arboretum, named after Joy Morton, who is the son of Jay Sterling Morton, uh, our Nebraska uh, Arbor Day founder. And so this prairie is one of the oldest um, restore, or not restored, but oldest uh, prairie construction in the nation. I think the Leopold Center, Alda Leopold Center, Wisconsin is a little older, but this was actually uh, called the Schulenburg Prairie. And this was started, uh, uh, gosh, I want to say back in the 50s. And he did a combination of plugs and seed. So some of the slower growing prairie plants, uh, they, they grew uh, from seed and, and planted plugs. First, they, they put down a seed mix, and then they went through and plugged in some of these keystone species. Uh, so lead plant, one of my faves. So I just had to point that out. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to advance the slide. Oh, there we go. Yeah, and then another thing, you know, with one-tenth of one percent of the eastern tall grass prairie left, a lot of people are like, okay, what, is, what does that mean, gardening with prairie plants? Well, this is a scene out in the Pine Ridge. So if you say native to Nebraska and you're in Lincoln, and, and you're, you're saying, okay, well, Shadron is native, right? Scott's Bluff is native. Well, they're, Shadron's eight hours from here. And last time I checked, St. Louis is only seven hours from here, right? Minneapolis, seven hours. Chicago, nine. So if you go east, isn't that just as native as western Nebraska? Because man drew borders, the plants didn't. So it's hard to say prairie plants from western Nebraska doing well here in the east because they don't. We actually get too much moisture. Now there's a few that do, but most of those, that's why we do conservation. We protect the prairies out west because man can't duplicate what, what is taking place in the Pine Ridge or in the Sand Hills. So if prairie plants are so darn great, why isn't everybody using them? And I think it's because kind of my bullet points here, there's many different types of prairie, right? There's mesic prairies. Uh, and mesic means kind of like, you know, you typically have uh, wet springs, um, dry winters, um, you know, low snowfall in the winter, dry summers. And uh, of course you have dry prairies, upland prairies, lowland prairies, wet prairies, tall grass, mid grass, short grass, savanna, woodland, rocky, blah. So there's so many prairies to choose from, right? And what's fun about that is maybe you have a landscape and I tell people maybe even only do a 10 by 10 foot area where you're creating a, a prairie situation that you could call a rock garden. So if you if you create a rock garden and you can look up soil amendments, you know how to make that that sharply drained soil so rock garden plants can handle that. And for me, it's just using uh, uh, an equal combination of uh, topsoil, good topsoil, uh, maybe some uh, leaf mold or, or finished compost, um, and then a quarter gravel and a quarter sand, believe it or not. And then you, you bring that soil up above grade, uh, maybe a foot, sometimes two feet, and then you're, you're kind of creating a berm with that, that loose soil. 
And then if you want to grow a garden plant from Western Nebraska or a garden plant that, that wants those rock garden conditions, you have the soil to plant them in. A good example is penstemons. They really love that type of soil. And you'll even get reseeding taking place if you create that type of soil. So I challenge you to make a little rock garden patch of your own. And usually for me, that rock garden is set up the furthest distance from my hose because I want to set up that rock garden planting so I never have to water it. And then gardeners aren't sure what a prairie plant is, right? And uh, and people don't ask for them at the nursery because they aren't sure what a prairie plant is. And the nurseries aren't necessarily going to carry something you're not asking for. So that's why they're not common in the nurseries. Um, and then, yeah, why, why, why carry a plant people aren't demanding? So somebody's got a yeah, topsoil, compost, sand, and what else? You know, Lillian, I just use road gravel because it's the cheapest. You can certainly use pea gravel, but it's, you know, a little a little bigger. But road gravel works great because it's cheap. And then rather than mulching, say, with grass clippings or mulching with wood chips, you actually use, uh, um, you can use uh, granite chips or you can use limestone chips or you can use just road gravel as your mulch. So gravel mulch is kind of hard to kind of scratch your head going, really, that's the mulch? That's not holding in moisture. Well, your idea is to not hold in a moisture because these plants grow naturally in areas that are much drier than eastern Nebraska. So hopefully that answers your question. Then you can get some cool rocks. If you're a rock hound like me, you can mix in rocks and kind of bury them halfway in that. So it looks like a not a garden of rocks, but a rock garden. So it looks like the rocks have been there for a long time, if that makes sense. But I could do a whole talk just on, on rock gardening with prairie plants, which is kind of fun. Okay, so assess your site. Learn as much as you can about the site you've chosen. What is the sun exposure? What is the quality of that soil? You know, if maybe you're new to gardening in that area, you know, dig up a little bit. See how heavy your clay is. See how well-drained it is. Because go, prairie plants like highly oxygenated soil. They like soil that drains easily. Uh, the heavy clay is not prairie soil, right? And now that being said, a lot of prairie plants do just fine without any soil amendment, but uh, to be safe, I always do it. And, uh, and what I mean by learn as much about your site, I've had people want to go native, want to go prairie plants, and they plant these, these plants that like wall-to-wall -wall sunshine, well, and they have a big shade tree in the backyard, so it's only get, getting sun half the day those plants get floppy and they don't look good. And then you're disappointed. So that's why this talk is kind of like, all right, we've got prairie, then we got savanna, we got woodland. I see another question up there. Love rocks, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So it's a good way to display your rocks. You see, if you're a rock collector or a rock hound like myself. And then what do you hope to accomplish with your project? Are you after helping pollinators? Are you after just, you know, getting more native plants out there just for posterity purpose? Because native plants are so rare in the landscape. You know, in Nebraska, we got one tenth of one percent of tall grass prairie. But the prairie state, do you know which one that is? What they call the prairie state? That's Illinois. Illinois actually has less prairie, unplowed prairie than we do, which is saying something because we have one tenth of one percent. So anyway, um, try to design a native plant community to emulate uh, a thriving natural ecosystem. That's why, again, I separated into prairie, savanna, and woodland. Choose native species that are appropriate to the sun exposure, soil type, and moisture level of your site, meaning some prairie plants, upland prairie plants specifically, prefer growing in sandy conditions, a la the sand hills, uh, the Pine Ridge, dry, well-drained soil. But basically, you can think of it like this. A prairie plant is that plant that likes full sun, literally wall-to-wall -wall sunshine. They will grow well with six or more, hour, you know, with six hours at the minimum. But I like reserving those prairie plants for those hot spots of the landscape, right? So you never have to worry about irrigating them once they're established. And then savanna is more or less part shade gardening. It grows naturally with three to six hours of sunlight. And of course, woodland is more of your shade gardening, which grows naturally with less than three hours of sunlight. So that's kind of the definition from layman's terms to, for, for those three types of native plantings. And you may have all three conditions in your yard. Most of us do, right? And then you've got wet prairies, which is basically soggy for most of the year. And you probably heard rain gardens are in the news, right? Uh, you know, with, with the ongoing drought, uh, keeping the water on your site is huge. So creating a shallow depression in your yard to 
to accept the water from your downspouts is a huge thing, uh, but they don't always remain soggy for most of the year, right? When we're in a drought, your rain garden is dry too. So the plants you choose for your rain garden better be able to take it wet and dry. And the good news is lowland prairie species that grew in those lowland areas can take it wet and they can take it dry. So then you got, this is more of your mesic types conditions, average garden soil, water soaks in with no runoff. You know, your medium wet is wet in winter, spring and after heavy rain, often dries out in summer. Sounds like Nebraska, right? And then you got medium to dry, well-drained. And, uh, and then you've got xeric conditions, which doesn't mean zero plants, but more uh, dry land species, which is water is excessively drained. That's that rock garden situation I was telling you about. And what can we do about it? Okay, we, we can demonstrate prairie gardening, right? And, and I would just challenge you, you know what an iris is, you know what a daffodil is, right? You know what a daylily is, you learn those plants, you know what a peony is, right? But can you rattle off six native plants? Well, don't worry about learning all of them at once. Learn six a year, learn a half dozen a year. And then, you know, five years pass, all of a sudden you're familiar with 30 species and get to know that plant intimately. You know, uh, man, with that encyclopedia right in front of us with Google and our smartphones, look this stuff up uh, and, and fall into that rabbit hole. It really makes a difference. And then I'd encourage you to visit local arboretums and parks that have demonstrations that feature prairie plants, you know, like Pioneers Park Nature Center, for example, so you can see what these prairie uh, plants look like in, in a demonstration type setting. And of course, encourage more demonstration plantings, you know, talk to the university, call them and say, why doesn't UNL have more uh, prairie demonstration plantings in that public space because in my personal opinion i think there should be prairie plantings all over campus you know you can encourage other corporate campuses a great one to visit is the emeritus building the emeritus life building here in lincoln they've done a bang up job incorporating a lot of prairie plants in that huge campus that they have around what is it uh, uh 23rd and p something like that so yeah that's how we can make a difference not only can you but encourage uh, national business chains. How cool would it be for a, a McDonald's to say, you know, we're going to landscape with more than river rock and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a yucca plant, you know, or whatever they do, man, they could do all sorts of cool stuff from a corporate level to make a difference. Let's see. Somebody asked, what's their phone number? I'm not sure what that's about. So I'm going to blow that off. Um, does it matter? Well, prairie gardens benefit wildlife that depends on grassland habitats. Prairie plants provide the food shelter, nesting cover for songbirds, beneficial insects, and then other critters that basically conventional landscapes just can't do. What I mean by conventional landscapes is maybe it's mostly turf grass and they have a few plants shoved up against their foundation, maybe a row of barberry or a few shrub roses or you know a few hostas those are not going to benefit uh, our native insects. And are they sustainable? And this is a quote from a book called Gardening with Prairie Plants. It's a great book. I think it was lit written by, uh, her last name was Wasowski. And that book is out of Texas. But a lot of the concepts in that Gardening with Prairie Plants is completely uh, relevant here in Nebraska. And this is one of the, the things she said, and I really like this. If you continue to water after the plants are established, the plants that survive will be those that require that extra water, right? And you're stuck watering forever because you're playing a guessing game. Like, will you survive it by quit watering it? I don't know, you've been watering it ever since. The plants that belong on your site, the ones that can live just on rainfall, even during a drought, rotted because they got too wet or were outcompeted by the more water tolerant ones. In the Great Plains, especially during a drought year like this year, a watering every month or so may be necessary to keep your garden from going dormant, meaning it's going to look a little rough if you don't water. But if you don't water, rest assured your garden does go dormant. It's okay. Nothing is likely to die. Even during the Great Depression, the dirty 30s, those plants came back, right? Those prairie plants came back. Well, the reason the dirty 30s was such an issue is we had five years in a row if you remember 2012, that was a big drought year. And in fact, some areas of Nebraska, the driest since records were kept in the late, uh, what, 1870s. Um, the problem with the Dust Bowl is we had five of those in a row. Ouch. Is that going to happen again? 
I say, it's not if, it's when. And I'm just praying this isn't the start of a five-year drought, because if it is, we have much more problems to worry about, right, than whether or not my prairie plant's going to make it uh, next time. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, very good. Yes, excellent. I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Mark, um, I'm, because I wanted to mention that as well. The tour of the wild side on Sat, uh, wait, Saturday, July 29th um, is a great thing. And then there's also another tour coming up with uh, rewilding or, or, oh gosh, I, I can't remember the name. If somebody can think of it, please type it in the chat because my place is actually on that tour. You think I would remember the name of the event, but but that's awesome that, uh, that you reminded folks of that. Uh, thanks so much, Mark. I appreciate that. But if anybody knows about that rewilding Lincoln event coming up on June 11th, uh, please post it. All right, so disadvantages of prairie gardens. Again, if it was so great, why isn't everybody doing it? Well, because a prairie landscape can look overgrown and weedy to the public. I say, well, maybe it can. And where I see it kind of looking overgrown and weedy is all you chose was tall plants and you didn't include any grasses in your mix. What I like to make it really look like a, uh, a defined prairie landscape is like a 50-50 mix, like half grasses and half forbs. And all forbs are, are wildflowers, right? So if you do a 50-50 mix, it really helps to keep it from looking weedy to the public. Because if you know prairie plants, what they often do is they don't bloom from the bottom up. They oftentimes just set their flowers on the top of the plant, if you notice that. And why is that? Well, because traditionally the prairie, all these plants were growing so close together that, you know, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to, to develop flowers down low because the sun, you were shaded by your, your buddy next door. John Weaver, who studied prairie at UNL here back in the, oh gosh, 20s and 30s, um, found that uh, in one, one square yard of prairie, over 200 individual plants. Now, we're not going to go in there and plug prairie plants one inch on center because of budgets, right? But just know those plants are used to uh, competition. They're used to growing right next to their buddy, and that keeps the plant in check by having that competition. They're never going to outgrow their space, if you will. And, and also another disadvantage is they require a very large lot size, right? You have to have a huge yard to do a prairie landscape. No, you don't. A prairie landscape can be a little... Uh, postage stamp signature representation of the prairie. Heck, it can be 10 by 10 feet. And if everybody's there's a little 10 by 10 foot prairie garden and we're all connecting the dots, all of a sudden we're making a difference uh, slowly but surely shoring up our nation's biodiversity by converting to a prairie garden. Converting to a prairie garden is costly. Well, it depends. And that's why I say, uh, you know, start, start small and just grow every year, you know, start with a 10 by 10 foot area, and then you'll find out how easy it was. And you say, okay, I'm just going to do another 10 by 10 next year and a 10 by 10 a year after that, or maybe you, you get brave enough to do a 40 by 40, right? So, so start simple and expand from there. Prairie plants are still established and weed control is a problem. Yes, weeds, certainly prairie plants don't keep out the weeds. That's why we like to plant tight. So the prairie plants become their own mulch, if you will. So you're not out there having to put down wood chips every year. Uh, these plants will kind of shade the ground themselves. I haven't put down wood chips in my home landscape for, gosh, probably 10 to 15 years, probably because I've unloaded semi loads in my lifetime of, of wood chips to do landscaping. I'm tired of it. I don't want to do it anymore. And another thing in my home landscape, I haven't put out a sprinkler to water my gardens, oh gosh, I can't remember the last time. I didn't even use a sprinkler in the 2012 drought. And uh, that's saying something folks, because I'm tempted to, right? It's dry right now, but I know just like I said in that statement before, um, if I start watering, then I'm not gonna know who can survive without that supplemental irrigation. But again, that being said, if you wanna perk up your landscape, watering once a month in a time of a drought, certainly isn't going to hurt. Okay, so don't design your prairie garden with an automatic irrigation system. You don't need it. You're going to waste your money. They're expensive. Just don't do it. It's not needed. Don't mulch too deep. Oftentimes, people will plant these little prairie plugs, and they'll put three, four inches of wood chip mulch down and kind of bury those plants. A light layer is all you need to keep the sun directly off that soil for a time until they get established. And then once they're established, you don't have to go back and remulch. The plants will do it for you. 
And then I often see plants spaced like three foot apart, you know, and hope they grow together. If you start spacing everything three feet apart, the weeds are going to show up in between those plugs. And when I'm watering my prairie plants, uh, initially, if I'm doing it from plugs, I'm watering each individual plant. I'm not setting up a sprinkler and letting it run for 30 minutes and watering the whole darn bed because if I'm getting those spaces wet in between my prairie plugs, weeds are going to say, hello, thank you very much. I think I'll grow. But if you just water the individual plants with a hose and a watering wand, you think you don't have time to do that. Well, one of the reasons you're gardening is to spend time in your garden. And all it takes is five to 10 minutes to literally water a large swath of plants individually. And people often ask, well, how often do I water? I usually baby mine for the first week or two. I'll water them every other day. Sometimes when it's 95 like this, um, I'll water them every day. Just a little bit of water. You know, Maybe I'm holding my wand over that plug for you know, 10 seconds. I'm not counting 10 seconds, but uh, again, a little goes a long way. And then, yeah, mixing prairie plants that aren't adapted to your site. So that's like saying, okay, I did a dry land species, a penstemon, and I planted it next to Joe pie weed, which is a plant that likes wet conditions. So, you know, just pay attention to the plants you're choosing. And as I said before, start small, keep it simple. Try to plant your garden with at least 50% prairie grasses. Enrich the soil and the planting zone with topsoil, rich with humus and oxygen. Copy a prairie model using the same kind of soil topography on site. And there's lots of good references for you out there. Kind of my Bible when I first started all this prairie stuff was Prairie Moon Nursery. Prairie Moon Nursery has been in business a long time. They have a great website. They have great, uh, you know, uh, frequently asked questions type of thing with establishment, seed versus plugs, all that stuff. And Prairie Moon Nurseries up in uh, southwest, southeastern Minnesota, so a stone's throw from Nebraska. And another one that's been in business a long time is Missouri Wildflowers. I think they're a great company too. Um, you know, they, they know what they're doing and they're sticklers with local ecotype, both of those. And then we have Prairie Legacy uh, here in Nebraska doing a bang up job. We have Midwest Natives right here in Lincoln. And of course, we have the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum, the organization I work for that uh, also sells prairie plants. So you can get these plants now. And we couldn't necessarily say that 15 to 20 years ago. They were just not very readily available, but they are now. This is a strip that uh, I planted. Uh, this was just, uh, you know, your typical soil in Nebraska. I threw down probably six inches of leaves. And then we had a, a drive behind a four foot tiller behind a little Kubota tractor. And I just ran it down once and worked those leaves in it, let it sit all winter like that, uh, breaking down those leaves. I like to prepare my beds in the fall. So when spring rolls around, it's ready for me rather than trying to hustle and get everything done in the spring. Fall is a great time for bed prep. So that way your bed is ready for you in the spring. Okay, so now I wanna talk quickly about grasses. Um, there's short grasses, there's tall grasses. So we got short grass prairie out in the panhandle. We got more mixed grass prairie in, in the central part of the state. And then here in the east, we have what we call tall grass prairie. But that doesn't mean you can't grow short grasses in your own home landscape. Just remember those short grasses being native to the central and western part of the state aren't used to all the moisture we get here in the east. So you don't have to water even during times of drought. They're very drought tolerant. And that one slide before that said, if you keep watering, you'll probably kill these plants. That's very true with the short grasses. And I'll show you some of their names here as we go forward. So yeah, that drought tolerant require little, if any, supplemental irrigation. And of course, choose wildflowers that thrive under those similar conditions. And consider short-lived selections that reseed amongst grass clumps that more or less naturalize in your garden. They will expand rather than retreat. And that's my kind of plant. I would rather have one. It's not going to become weedy, especially if you have competition in there. But you'll have a seedling show up here and there and everywhere. That's a good thing. Because... Those are free plants. You didn't have to pay for them, right? That's cool. Why use grasses? Uh, well, they, they thrive despite our weather extremes and soil types. They require little, if any, supplemental irrigation. They resist insect pests and disease. They provide habitat for local wildlife. And get this, deer do don't, won't eat your prairie grasses. Bunnies won't eat your prairie grasses. 
Heck, grasshoppers don't even eat them. And I've seen proof of that. There was a very bad grasshopper year. Uh, a gardening friend of mine said the grasshoppers just completely ate up her vegetable garden. Heck, they were so bad. They were eating the uh, the, the the screen on her, on her uh, front porch, but they weren't touching the prairie grasses. They were leaving them alone. So use that to your advantage if you if you're trying to garden and the and the bunnies and the deer are eating you out of house and home and budget. Uh, I like grasses because of the sound and movement in the landscape. You know, as Willa Cather said, the earth seemed to be moving. That was the that was the the prairie grasses swaying and blowing in the wind, right? And then the backlighting with light and translucency, the quality of line, their form and texture. So the fine texture of a grass. Uh, planted next to a what we call a coarse texture, say of a purple cone flower, it it highlights and kind of frames that coarse texture of that purple cone flower. So they really they look good together to the human eye. And of course, grasses come in a variety of textures. Their foliage and and their seed heads um, have different colors. So they're just a winner. So they have form, texture, right? They have sound and movement. This picture. Obviously, it's not a video, so you can't see the movement, but this is on a very windy day. That's why the grass looks like it's flopping. Well, it's just dancing in the wind, right? That's my favorite part of grasses. And then that light and translucency, you know, when you think of grasses, prairie grasses, you often think of fall, right? And uh, the low light of uh, a late September evening, uh, when that sun's going down, uh, backlighting on that grasses, it's just like, ooh, picture moment. And then what we mean by quality of line is, again, a very vertical line that kind of that fine texture, if you will, uh, is what we mean by that. So let's go through a few grasses. So you either say, my landscape, I really don't want these plants because of neighbors, because of just whatever it's, maybe it's along the roadway and there's height restrictions, you know, uh, city of Lincoln doesn't allow anything higher than 37 inches. That's kind of their, their cutoff for, for plants between the sidewalk and the curb or the right of way. So that's where you would use these shorter prairie grasses. And to me, the, the top shorter prairie grasses are these next four or five that I'm gonna show you. Uh, Blue Grama is one of my favorites. Uh, the, the settlers called it mosquito grass. And I guess if you squint, uh, those seed heads kind of look like a cloud of mosquitoes. They also call it eyelash grass because uh, as the, uh, the seed heads would dry on that, that lower right picture, uh, they kind of bend back and kind of look like an eyelash. But look at that wonderful combination. This is Russian sage, certainly not native to Nebraska, right? Called Russian sage. But again, you don't have to chastise yourself for planting a native blue grama next to a non-native. Just do it. Don't don't uh, question yourself. And I was, I went to this one talk this dude was given in Kansas, and he said one of the way to get your neighbors to accept your so-called prairie look, if you're concerned about it, is plant things that your neighbors are familiar with. So you look here, we got barberry roses the little meatball uh, spruces, they're common. And I think I think these are bedding plants over here. Everything else is blue grama. This is a, 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 a seed uh, mix, if you will. I think it was blue grama buffalo grass mix. Wonderful seed mix for doing uh, a more resilient garden. But just know, look at this site. This is out in the country next to a big machine shed. We're pretty expensive machine shed, right? But uh, they never mow this. They mow it back in the spring. So here's a very resilient garden that doesn't require mowing, and that's as tall as it gets. We call that more of a, a meadow type garden, right? And then then uh, a close relative to blue grama is Cytos grama. The two look great together in your so-called short grass prairie garden. Cytos is so versatile, so easy to do. There's lots of it planted over that uh, Emeritus Life building. So I encourage you to visit that Emeritus Life in June when the Cytos grama is only maybe six inches tall and then and then visit it again in, later in July when these cool seed heads are on the plant. You can see where it gets its name where it almost looks like oats and the little oat-like uh, structures are all hanging down one side of the stem, hence the name side oats. And, you know, again, kind of a nondescript grass. It's not loud. It's not horribly ornamental. But man, it sure is tough. It'll be with you the rest of your days uh, if you plant this grass along with blue grama.
so tough and versatile. And then a lot of different planting combinations. This is here in Lincoln um, at the, um, um, oh, poo, what's the, what's the garden? Uh, I'm having a brain lapse here. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the garden, right? Right down here. Somebody chime in with the chat. There we go. Let's see what you said. Yeah. Oh, I meant a surety. Yes. Thanks, Margo. Yes. The surety building at 23rd and P. This is the, uh, uh, the garden there where, uh, um, oh, Folk and Roots and the Hub Cafe and all that. So this is just two plants uh, planted in, in repetition. This is side oats here, the grass, and this tall gay feather is thick spike gay feather, kind of the granddaddy of the prairie. What a wonderful combination. They could have just planted all side oats, grama. They could have just planted all gay feather. But mixing the two, I think, really makes for a lovely combination. And the fine line of that grass helps um, highlight the coarse texture of that gay feather, right? I think it's a lovely combo. One of the most popular short grass prairie uh, plants out there is little blue stem. You can't go wrong with little blue stem. This is what little blue stem looks like. I would say this picture is uh, taken you know, late May, early June. So they take their sweet time, they're warm season grasses. So they take their sweet time in, uh, in greening up in the spring. But once they do, they're, they're lovely little tufts. And you see the space in between those grasses? That's where you can plant your, your prairie wildflowers. And it's kind of hard to tell with this image, but notice there's no wood chip mulch. This is gravel mulch they're using there. Little blue stem says, I like that. I would rather have gravel mulch than wood chip mulch. Thank you very much. And if you've ever bumped into little blue stem where it grows naturally in nature, you would see why it likes gravel mulch because it grows in some rough soil, folks. In the fall is when little blue stem shines. There's a popular one in the trade called Blaze. And Blaze was actually originally developed um, through our plant material centers and the seed was collected in Nebraska. So even though it has a name, it often gets lumped as, oh, well, that's a cultivar. I want the straight species. Well, do your research. This is a seed strain. This is a seed strain from Nebraska. So yes, it's a local ecotype. It just has a name. And oftentimes those names were given to make the plant a little more sexy to the, you know, it's a marketing thing. You know, why do you call it blaze? Because in the fall, it's a, a, a blaze of orangish, yellowish copper. And again, I'll, I'll use Willa Cather. She called it shaggy grass country where she moved to in Nebraska. And the, the grass she was referring to is little blue stem that kind of looked like a, a shaggy dog you wanted to pet, right? And she also mentioned that the prairies seem to be on fire yet never burning. Well, that's the fiery color of little blue stem in the fall. How cool is that? One of my favorite short grass prairie plants is prairie drop seed. It's one that takes patience. It takes several years to really come into its own to look like something like this. But man, wouldn't you want this baby in your landscape? Isn't that cool? And again, notice the space between the plants. These are clumpers that grow as a tight clump and then kind of fountain over like that. You could have a penstemon coming out of here or a gay feather or lots of different prairie plants coming right out of that grass. Or you can just keep it simple and do nothing but grass, right? That's up to you. Late, this is kind of a more of a spring shot, spring into early summer shot right here. Later on in the fall, it sends these light airy seed heads up above that grass clump. Again, now you're seeing, why does this picture appeal to your eye? I'm pausing to let you answer it in your brain because it's backlit by the sun, right? So this is a late September shot where the sun is low in the horizon around sunset. That backlighting is just delicious, right? And then even later than that, it'll get some nice fall colors, often little reds. Most of the time it's subtle, but, uh, but, but awesome, awesomely subtly beautiful. Then you could say, okay, so those were your, I want a shorter prairie garden, right? Well, maybe you have space and, and you want it taller. You Maybe you're trying to screen something or maybe you just say, well, I like tall plants. I like tall plants, but a lot of people get afraid of tall plants, like the boogeyman's hiding behind them or something. Don't be afraid of tall plants. They're not going to do anything to harm you. So taller grasses, this is where the big blue stems come in, right? The often called turkey's foot. You can see it kind of the, the seed heads kind of come in threes. 
hence the name turkey foot. And these are the pollen grains. And don't worry, hay fever sufferers, these pollen grains are too heavy to be carried by the wind, per se. So you're not going to suffer as you would with uh, right now allergy season. I know <laughs> hay fever sufferers are really begging right now. It's that darn smooth brome grass that's in full uh, flower right now that's giving you those problems. Biggest noxious weed in Nebraska, if not the nation. And then this one you might see, uh, Pawnee is another cultivar, so-called cultivar name of Big Blue Stem. Pawnee is a seed strain. It's not a, you know, something that was introduced by, by humans in a lab coat. It was no hybrid, nothing like that. It was a seed strain that they gave the name Pawnee that came from Nebraska. So uh, just know that. Indian grass, wow, one of my favorite tall grass. So mixing big blue stem and Indian grass in a tall grass prairie landscape is a, an awesome thing to do. They sway in the slightest breeze, uh, just a granddaddy at the tall grass prairie. They often get some great fall color on them, uh, some nice yellow in the, in the foliage in addition to the, the awesome seed heads. But here again, you see this planting, there's no wildflowers, right? It's just grass. There's no reason in these empty spaces here, you couldn't have a tall wildflower coming up in between these grasses, right? But to keep it simple, to, to make you a successful gardener, start with the grasses and then plug in the forbs uh, a year or two later. Switchgrass, sorry about the blurry image there, but switchgrass, uh, Dallas Blues uh, is one that was named Dallas Blues because the dude that developed it or named it uh, was a Dallas Cowboys fan, and uh, actually, I think the plant was uh, was named out of Wisconsin, but because he was a Dallas fan, he named it Dallas Blues because the foliage was a little more blue than than your typical switchgrass, right? And they they can get some great fall color. This is Dallas Blues with some amazing fall color. Isn't that gorgeous? This is probably a late September shot here. And uh, another very popular switchgrass is called Northwind, probably the most popular because it's so um, upright, very upright and uh, well behaved and snow loads won't bring it down, uh, just stays upright all winter long. And you might be asking, well, when do I cut this back? Do I cut it back? I leave always, always leave them up all through the winter for wildlife habitats. So beneficial insects have a place to overwinter and then you can cut them back in the spring but oftentimes cutting them back late in spring. I'm talking not late, late spring, but you know, sometime mid-April rather than getting excited and cutting back in mid-March. And they have some nice fall color as well. This is North Wind in the fall. See that beautiful yellow with those uh, nice airy seed heads, awesome grass. And there it is with some hoar frost in the wintertime. So man, can't go wrong with North Wind switchgrass, you guys. It's so easy, so versatile be with you for the rest of your days. All right, now I'll go into some spring bloomers here. I'm gonna kind of go by um, uh, spring into summer into fall. Um, and just remember, you don't have to think, you don't have to remember all this stuff. Uh, the PowerPoint will be available if you get bored in your life and you wanna view it again just for a reference. It'll all be there. You just sit back and enjoy the ride. Prairie smoke is an awesome prairie plant, very popular. We offer it every year and it's usually sold out, you know, and people get disappointed like, well, don't you have any prairie smoke? Yeah, I did. It's gone already. And you can see the cool seed heads and it's called prairie smoke. It's not native to Nebraska. It's native to places like Minnesota, South Dakota. It's a northern species. And, and out in the prairies where this plant is in, uh, in great numbers, you know, doing that drive-by and you're seeing it in the landscape, it almost looks like the smoke, if you will, hence the name prairie smoke. It likes it dry, it likes it well-drained, full sun, easy plant to grow, and I think the foliage is attractive. So this is a plant that's just starting to send up a flower here, so kind of attractive cut leaf fern-like foliage, right, that, that looks good, and here you see it in front of uh, some common daisies and purple cone flowers. Lovely, lovely plant, and that blooms early in the spring. And what's cool about the flowers, well, cool, kind of cool, this is a it in full bloom. So these flowers never open. And that might disappoint you saying, well, the darn thing's in bud all the time. Doesn't it ever open? And if you look closely at this, this opening right here, that's the actual, that's the actual flower, right? And what's cool about this plant, its scientific name is GM triflorum. 
and tri is three, right? Triflorum are three flowers. So the flower scapes that come up out of this basal foliage, the flowers are always in threes. How cool is that, right? And then later on, after it's done blooming, you get, uh, well, there's some more cool flower pictures for you. Just an awesome little plant. It's one of those plants that's short. It's maybe only six inches tall to a foot in flower. So you would keep this kind of front and center of the landscape, one of those areas where you're walking by it, or you know maybe you're doing a stroll through the garden. It's a, the front of the border. Put me up front. And there is where the native range of prairie smoke is. So you see it kind of starts in, in uh, uh, northeastern Iowa, you know, a few counties in, in north central Iowa, but then it kind of does a jut around into Minnesota, South Dakota, all throughout the Rocky Mountains, but nowhere native to Nebraska. But everybody says, well, but it's a native plant. Well, yes, it's native somewhere, but it's not native to Nebraska. Is that a problem with you? It's certainly not a problem with me. And I think it's, the way I look at it, it's close enough is what I always say. So here's one in transition going from the flower to those lovely seed heads. And I like to describe the seed heads. I read it somewhere. It looks like troll doll hair, right? Remember the troll dolls? Yeah, troll doll hair. Maybe you can call it the troll doll hair plant, right? <laughs> oh, a great plant to plant with prairie, uh, uh, the, the prairie smoke is a lot of gardeners favorite, the pasc flower. And uh, we have native pasc flower and uh, there's also non-native pasc flowers. And, and I, I hear people get bent out of shape and why one of the native? Well, I'm sorry, the other one, the, the pulsatilla vulgaris, which is native to Europe, also attracts native pollinators. It's just as good. So don't uh, fret if you tried to get the native and you couldn't, they're all good. But pasc flower is a plant uh, easy to grow if you give it high and dry conditions. It's not long lived if you plant it in a garden where you know it's not well drained. Um, you know maybe it's getting too much shade. It, the plant's going to kind of go away. And if you look closely, the plant is covered in silky hairs. And why would that be? The plant is covering itself in silky hairs. And I want you to think about that before I answer it. There are plants that are really woolly, we call them, where the, the, the hairs are literally visible. And one that, that protects the plant, if it's, trying, if it's blooming early in the spring, you better have a safety net there in case we do get a night where it's in the upper 20s and it freezes. That, that woolly uh, covering will protect the plant from freezing, kind of like an, an insulation, if you will. And that same hairy stem also protects it from that intense Nebraska wind on those open prairies. It keeps the moisture inside the plant. And, and that's a win-win. Oh, I've been ignoring the question and answer. Let's see what somebody says. Can you about, talk about starting these native forbs from seed? Some seem rather complicated. Yeah, Sydney, good question. And that's where I would use Prairie Moon Nursery as your Bible. You know, um, what, what a lot of prairie plants like, uh, these wildflowers, is called a winter vernalization. And so for you to be able to grow them indoors, um, they need a cold treatment. Because to a prairie plant, I'm not going to drop my seed and germinate in the fall and then have all my seedlings get killed over the winter. They need a winter chill before they will germinate in the spring. So you have to mimic those conditions by keeping them in your refrigerator for 60 to 90 days, depending on the plant. So uh, most of these wildflowers, these forbs, uh, from what I've seen, um, take around 60 days. Some only take 30 days. So if you're sowing it from seed this time of year, sure, your grasses will germinate, but those forbs more than likely are going to wait until the following spring to germinate. So planting your prairie from seed, the best time to do it is in the fall. And, and oftentimes people will do what's called a dormant seeding, like uh, early November, late October, you've got a big window, really the whole month of October, the whole month of November is when I would sow those seeds. And then they will get that winter chill. They will germinate the following spring. You certainly can do it in the spring, but just know um, you're taking your chances with, with some of those special species. Yes, there are some species that don't need a winter vernalization. 
you know, and, and there's not enough time to talk about which is which, right? But just know all that information's out there. Say you want to pass flower, for example, and you order some seed. This one has been a little tricky for me to grow from seed. A lot of them aren't though, the gay feathers, the golden rods, the, the, the cone flowers, um, easy to grow from seed. This one can be a little persnickety. So what I do with this one is uh, it gets some cool, well, I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you the seed heads. So here it is emerging in the spring. Native Americans called it old man of the prairie. To them, this was their plant calendar. When they saw past flower coming up on the prairie, they knew winter was pretty much over. This was kind of their harbinger of spring, if you will. And uh, you can see why they called it old man of the prairie. They thought it looked like an old man's hair, or maybe they thought the seed heads did. There again, the flower buds, you see it covered with the hairs, all the leaves, uh, gorgeous flower scapes. Here's the native range to past flower. So you can see it's native to Nebraska, mostly out in the sand hills and the panhandle. There's one south central Nebraska, but I guarantee you where the past flower is growing here, it's probably in less soil conditions, high and dry. These are high and dry prairies where it is here in the east. So not very common in Nebraska. And if you walk around these prairies looking for past flower, it's not common in these counties either. There's where it gets its name, Old Man of the Prairie. The silken seed heads are really cool too. So picture this with that prairie smoke, lovely combination. So as this seed head ages and the seeds are starting to fall off, you can just pluck those seeds off of there and then sow it in your garden. And because this is an upland species that I was telling you about and you have gravel mulch, that's where you're gonna get reseeding in that gravel mulch. If you have it in a standard garden with two inches of wood chip mulch, chances are you're not going to get any past flower to reseed. And I don't want you to be disappointed. That's why I'm telling you that. Uh, yeah, lovely plant, but but it, it's a little picky about its conditions. This one is not. Dwarf spiderwort, woefully overlooked and underutilized. When people think of spiderworts, they're like, oh, they're too aggressive. They, they're floppy. They seed around too much. You want this plant to seed everywhere. I've had it seed in my lawn and bloom at two inches high. Those flowers you're looking at are around two inches across. So big flowers for such a small little dainty plant. I've seen it bloom with these flowers two inches off the ground. So versatile and tough. And as Claude Barr talks about this plant in his book, Jewels of the Plains, he says, a very hairy little fellow. And again, what did I say about hairs? Why does a plant bother to put hairs on it? Well, we don't go into repeating that. But again, it's a drought tolerant mechanism. Yeah, here's Claude Barr's quote, a very hairy little spiderwort flowering freely for several weeks in early spring. It has kept its allotted space amongst other gentle mannered plants. It's a gentle mannered plant. So it can reseed itself right next to your big old tall goldenrod that's just getting started in the spring. And it'll say, I'm fine here. You don't have to transplant me. I'm good. Uh, one thing it does do, do after, yeah, here you see the, uh, the stems, how hairy they are. Kind of hard to tell uh, from these images a distance away. But once it gets done blooming and set seed, the plant goes dormant. And, uh, and you literally think, well, did it up and die on me? Did I kill it? No, it's going dormant to escape the heat of summer. And then in the fall, it sends up, uh, it sends up a cluster of leaves. So you know, no, don't worry about me, I'm still here. Think of grape hyacinth. If you know that plant, it blooms in the spring, goes dormant, just like a daffodil, just like a tulip, just like what, uh, gosh, any bulb, right? So we give those bulbs a break, but we can't give dwarf spiderwort a break. Well, I don't like that plant because it goes dormant. Well, last time I checked, you like daffodils, right? You like, you know, tulips. Man, plant this plant, get it in your garden, put it on your wish list. You want this, mainly because this plant's not common in nature. Uh, the, the dwarf spiderworts that we get in the trade from Bluebird Nursery, the statewide arboretum has been selling them for years came from an area in north central Kansas. If you know where Marysville is, just south of Beatrice, right across the border are these rocky outcroppings this, uh, that have a lot of iron in them. That's where this plant's growing in these rocky prairies. So if you were growing in that rocky prairie, wouldn't you want to go dormant in the summer too when it's hot and dry? I sure would. So they escape the heat of the summer. But what a show off. 
and and no two plants are the same color. That's what I like about it. It's a, a variety of colors with it. You know, you can have these pinks or you can have these rich uh, blues, you know, purples. Um, Harlan Hammernick at Bluebird Nursery, who helped introduce this plant along with the statewide arboretum, um, wanted to call it Jolly Rancher because it comes in a variety of colors, but we, we didn't get that far. Okay, now another awesome spring bloomer, woefully overlooked and underutilized. This plant is blooming right now in downtown Lincoln. It's been planted uh, throughout downtown Lincoln because they discovered how easy it is, how versatile it is. I mean, basically, um, you never have to water this plant once it's established. Shining Blue Star is a cousin to another one called Eastern Blue Star, and then another one's called Threadleaf Blue Star. Um, all three awesome species, but Shining is what I wanted to spotlight to, uh, tonight. Shining was named after its shiny foliage, and plants that have shiny leaves that look like literally they've been painted with varnish is another coping mechanism for drought. Those plants that have shiny leaves um, help, the shiny leaves help hold in the moisture. Just like those plants that have thick leathery leaves like an oak or a plant that has uh, uh, thick, uh, you know, thick leaves like a cacti, right? Or an aloe vera that holds the moisture in those big stems. So plants have come up with different coping mechanisms to handle drought. So this is what it looks like blooming in the spring, lovely little, pale blue flowers, almost white, they're so pale, uh, but blue star, gorgeous thing. And when they're emerging in the spring, to me, they almost look like asparagus when they're emerging in the spring, that clump is tight. They're, they're slow to uh, come into their own. They need probably three years to really come into, now my Amsonia has arrived. And notice I just said Amsonia because that's a scientific name. You know, Blue Star, yeah, yeah, that's kind of exciting to say, but Amsonia just sounds cool. Don't be afraid of scientific names. There you see the close-up of the flower and then that 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 attractive uh, shiny foliage. Cool plant, huh? Tough as nails. It'll be with you the rest of your days. And pollinators love them, bumblebees, be, uh, butterflies hit them. It's a good one. And, and, and incidentally, the dwarf spiderwort is a favorite of bumblebees too, past flower. Um, prairie smoke. So all of those for the early emerging bees and other beneficial insects in the landscape. One of my all-time favorite uh, prairie natives is dwarf blue indigo. This should be in every garden for posterity, if nothing else. Dwarf blue indigo, you guys, only occurs in a few counties in Kansas, one or two counties in Nebraska, and maybe one or two counties in Missouri in the world. So Everybody wants that exotic rare plant. Well, this is exotic, right? I think it's exotic looking and it's rare. So just for posterity to save this plant from, you know, extinction, because you never know, uh, plant it in your garden. There it again, emerging in the spring, very attractive. And when it's emerging, it already is developing flower buds. That, that's what you're seeing here. So the plants growing up and expanding those flower buds become these beautiful pea-like flowers, almost looks like a lupin. And lupins are a little persnickety to grow here in Nebraska, but not this dwarf blue indigo. Really the only problem with dwarf blue indigo is it takes several years to really come into its own. So you have to be a patient gardener. You know, you could have a, it'll outlive a peony. I call it the peony of the prairie because it just is so long lived and a favorite of bumblebees as well. Great pollinator plant. They prefer full sun, but they will tolerate part shade and they don't need help from you with irrigation. If you're familiar with uh, Kansas at all, if you take uh, the highway, I can't remember the highway, maybe it's 81 south of York, you hook up with Salina, Kansas is directly south of York, right? And if you keep going further south, you eventually hit Wichita. Well, halfway in between is a little town called Lindsburg, Kansas, the Swedish capital of Kansas. And outside of Can that town, um, I encourage you to visit that prairie because I was there once when there was literally a thousand of these things in bloom and my camera battery was dead. So I couldn't take a picture and there was nobody with me to share that moment. And I knew there was no way I was gonna probably see that, that scene again. Wow, so go to Coronado Heights, outside of Lindsborg, Kansas. If you're a Swede like me, you're going to find yourself to Lindsborg someday. It's worth a visit. 
there, yeah, there's the native range of baptism. Okay, I lied. It's native to more, more counties than just a few, but you get the drift. That is the only area it occurs in the world. I think that's reason enough to plant it. And there's a bumblebee working it over. Gorgeous plant, huh? And there it is combined in a garden with, uh, this is New Jersey tea that you see here, and then non-native iris. And then you see this over here is called a, a dwarf lead plant. And then we have some columbine, lovely plant combination. But you see, um, hard to see grasses in here, but there's no wood chip mulch. There doesn't need to be wood chip mulch because the, all the plants are growing together. You don't need to mulch it. And then later on, after it blooms, the foliage content, continues to expand and open up. And then uh, right around this time of year, uh, early June, all through the summer, you're left with this cool blue-green meatball of a plant, maybe two by two feet. Uh, gorgeous thing, right? It should be a replace the spirea as a shrub along your um, along your foundation. Very well behaved, very long lived. Will never need a drop of water from you. And then the, um, this one isn't showing the seed pods. Sometimes the seed pods can be covered by the foliage. Other times the, the seed pods will be up above the foliage. And that's a cool thing because I think they're very attractive. Early in the spring, like right now, as the flowers are fading, you get more of a chartreuse color. And then later on, yeah, there it is backlit by the sun, gorgeous uh, seed pods. And then later on in the summer, they turn this kind of a charcoal black color and uh, really gorgeous. This picture was taken really along the interstate at this uh, prairie planting, uh, the rest area between Lincoln and Omaha. Very nice place for you to visit. Tons of Baptisia minor they planted in there. But anyway, awesome plant. I see there's a question. Can you talk about, let's see, here we go, Lillian. I love your passion. I'm so excited to get started. All right, Lillian, thank you so much. <laughs> Now, sometimes I get a little excited. This is a Zarek garden I created a number of years ago. Um, this is where I did that soil mix. And I the whole garden was uh, was uh, uh, mulched with road gravel. And even the, the, the path down the middle was road gravel. And you can see there's cacti in there. There's penstemons, uh, coreopsis. Uh, this is a Western species. So it has a very Western look to me which I like, um, love the you know, Western landscapes. And if you look closely, this image down here where this plant's kind of fading, turning a little yellow and looking like it's dying, that's that dwarf spiderwort that's going dormant. And again, you'll see it and you'll go, oh, what, is there a disease happening here? No, it's just, it's just going down. It's starting to go dormant. Um, it'll disappear in the heat of summer and then reappear in the fall. But the plant we're really highlighting here is this white wild indigo, another Baptisia species, uh, Baptisia, however you want to pronounce it. We all say Baptisia, so it is what it is. But the white wild indigo, a native to the tall grass prairie here in the east, this is a tall boy. I mean, but it takes several years to get established, you know, so be patient. Lovely plant, but you're going to be frustrated having to wait three years for it to come into its own. But when it does, you'll say, okay, you were worth the wait. Lovely white flowers. Uh, there it is. Uh, this stalk right here is it emerging in the spring. So much like the dwarf blue indigo, the flower buds start immediately and almost looks like asparagus emerging out of the out of the ground. And there again, you see it in flower here. But where's the leaves? There's like no leaves yet. So the plant says, you know, I'm going to get my blooming done early because I know all my buddies are going to come up and kind of crowd me out, including grasses and stuff. So I'm going to bloom early and then I'm going to put on my foliage. I think I have an image of its foliage. Yes, yeah, starting to grow there. And here it is actually out in a native unplowed prairie here in Lancaster County near Elmwood. So there it is growing in nature. Pretty cool scene. Bumblebees love it. It gets interesting seed pods you can see compared to the dwarf blue indigo. Uh, unique seed pods. I like the, the how they form on the plant. Super cool. And they also turn that nice charcoal black uh, later on in the fall. Yeah, there we go. Uh, lovely in the fall as they are in the spring. Cool plant, huh? And then there's New Jersey tea. 
this is a kind of a what we call a, a suffrutescent plant. And a suffrutescent plant is it's it's shrub-like. What what that means is it has woody stems, but oftentimes dies back to the ground every spring, unlike a shrub, a woody shrub that uh, you know stays hardy above ground. This one, if the rabbits don't eat it down to the ground, it often dies back to the ground. So you just cut it back and, and let it uh, come up again and do its thing lovely flowers this actually i took this picture i was down at jazz in june in lincoln wandering around campus listening to jazz while i was looking for photo ops and here was this uh, new jersey tea and out of its autumn splinter isn't that a cool flower overlooked and underutilized we don't have it for sale now i wasn't wasn't able to get really any this spring but so i know you want it looking at this but be patient put it on your wish list because you got to have it and why do they call it New Jersey tea? Well, I've tried it before. It makes a fine tea. After it blooms, uh, you get these cool seed heads that are kind of reddish in color that are actually attractive in my book. Uh, later on, they turn black and then it'll kind of scatter the seed from there. Cool, cool plant. Put it on your wish list. Okay, now we'll come to summer bloomers. And, and again, <laughs> I'll reiterate, uh, I know you appreciate my enthusiasm, uh, but um, I have a lot of a lot of pictures here. I'm probably not going to get through everything. I'll do my best, but just know if we don't get to the woodland plants, uh, the PowerPoint will be available. You can just scroll through on your own leisure and get some great woodland uh, savanna slash woodland plants uh, ideas as well from this PowerPoint. We'll just I just want to apologize if I don't make it uh, all the way through. Lovely prairie plant. A lot of people know purple coneflower. This is purple coneflower's cousin, pale purple coneflower, Echinacea pallida. The, uh, the purple coneflowers we all know from the garden centers is Echinacea purpurea. So pallida is a different animal. It's more drought tolerant than purpurea will ever be. I mean, this thing can be out in the driest, hottest, sunniest area you've got in the garden. It has one heck of a root system. And what I like about this plant is on a breezy day like today, those, those rays that are coming down like this dance in the slightest breeze. Very, And of course, the, the plant being taller, you know, about a three foot tall plant you're looking at there, they sway in the breeze too. So really a lovely plant for that, but it wants and needs wall to wall sunshine. It will not perform well for you if it in part shade or, or a savanna type setting, okay? But lovely plant, I don't know if I have a close up of the flower. I hope so. I'll, I'll point it out here. It's a little harder to tell, but okay. So what we call composite flowers, you guys, if you learn anything tonight, remember this and look at your flowers closely and say, oh, that's that cone Bob was talking about because a lot of plants have this situation. So the actual, these are what we call rays, the, the ray flowers. And that's to kind of send a message to the insect Oh yeah, dude, come on over here. You'll find some nectar. But if you look closely at this, uh, at the this the cone, you see these little white dots. Each one of those little white dots is an individual flower. One little white dot is a flower. So if you've noticed and watched the bees working over a cone flower, they're often kind of like like excitedly going around that flower. And if you look at each one of these individuals. They're all at kind of a different stage, right? Uh, some of them are up higher, some most are up higher, right? Um, so that 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 ring that you're seeing bloom starts down below. So all the lower part of this cone, if you can see my cursor, these are all spent flowers. And then up here, the ring of flowers is the new ones. And then in the middle of that cone up here, these haven't bloomed yet. These are still in bud stage. So the reason the cone flowers bloom so long and why you like them is because it's not going to stop that show until it's worked its way all the way up that cone. Does that make sense? Why would a flower bother to, bother to do that, do you suppose? Again, I'm going to pause you so you can ponder that. Well, if I'm a flower and I bother to bloom during a rainstorm or during a cool cloudy day and the insects really aren't moving that much, I better make sure I have flowers the next day. And the next day after that, it guarantees repeat visitors, right? And then the plant lines up the seeds in that cone too. So just a really cool thing to see. 
here it is growing in uh, that Zeric garden I planted. Love, love, love the pale purple cone flower. Put it, yeah, there's a better, better view. So here you see it started down here that this lower ring is pretty much almost spent. Here's the new, these are, these are buds just starting to open. And then all the top part of this cone still hasn't bloomed yet. So it's, it's just going to work its way up uh, daily. And then later on in the fall and into the winter, the seed heads, I think, are very showy, especially backlit by the sun or planted with grasses. There it is, kind of uh, that, that coarse and fine texture I was talking about. This is sand love grass you're seeing. Man, the two together, I think, is just a lovely combination. I think that shot was taken in December, by the way. Okay, uh, I showed you dwarf spiderwort. This is its cousin, the prairie spiderwort, also called Ohio spiderwort. You see the scientific name, Ohioensis. Sure, it's native to Hawaii, Ohio, but it's also native here. But you notice in this picture, this is planted in a xeric garden. You see the rock over here. You see the uh, rock mulch rather than wood chip mulch. Plants saying, dude, this is what I want. I don't want that wood chip mulch. And tough prairie plant, if you ever canoe the Niobrara in uh, June, this is the one you'll see blooming in the prairies of the sand hills. Easy plant, pollinators love it. Um, you know, just, just a gorgeous thing up close. Um, awesome plant, the Ohio spiderwort. It just blooms probably a month later than that dwarf spiderwort that I was showing you earlier. And it probably gets, oh, I would say on a good day, knee high. Whereas the dwarf spider warts maybe only six inches high, so it's a little bit taller, and a lovely combination. If you know this, uh, the the um, smooth penstemon husker red, the two bloom around the same time. Lovely to combine the two in a garden. All right, so let's talk about the penstemons, a great group of plants. Uh, you know, keystone species. Uh, invite a variety of pollinating insects to them. And uh, so so lots of different penstemons to choose from. One of the most common in Nebraska is the shell leaf penstemon. It's out blooming in our sand hills right now, those dry upland prairies. I think the plant is just as cool when it's not in flower as it is when it is in flower. I mean, I think that's just gorgeous. And you can see where it gets its name. It kind of looks like a clam shell or a, 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 a shell, right? What I want you to notice is the, the leaves were clasped to the stem right here. Uh, and then the next rung up, they're clasped to the stem on the opposite side, back and forth, back and forth. Why would the plant bother to do that? Why doesn't it just clasp them all on the same side? Well, because if I if I move them side to side like this, the sun's guaranteed to hit every leaf, right? So it, it's a even distribution of those leaves. So the plant takes full advantage of the sun when it's shining. And then another cool thing about this plant is the flowers and the buds rest right in the uh, tops of those leaves. So where you're seeing it here in leaf stage, you see the buds just starting to form. They're all resting right in that little clamshell. How cool is that? Another uh, penstemon here in the eastern part of the state, rare, but you can see it in certain prairies. There's a prairie down by, uh, unplowed prairie down by Fairbury, uh, Rock Creek Station, that I encourage you to visit. That's where you can see Cobia penstemon in nature. Um, cool, cool penstemon. Probably the largest flowered penstemon of all of them in, in, uh, in nature. Penstemons are dry land species. They want it high and dry. They want it well drained. They want that rock garden condition that I was telling you about. But notice again, the flowers kind of uh, in the margins of the leaves. Big tubular flowers, gorgeous thing that the bumblebees will crawl inside. Uh, smooth penstemon and hairy are just both easy to grow in the garden. They don't need that xeric condition to, to uh, perpetuate. These are very versatile in the garden, but hairy penstemon's not native to Nebraska. It's native more to the Eastern United States, which means I'm used to growing with higher rainfall versus Shelley penstemon or the Kobe I just showed you, they want rock garden conditions. So we often kill them easily, planting them in our standard garden. But the hairy and the smooth are very, um, I shouldn't say very long lived, but much more long lived than the others will ever be. 
Uh, love the two-tone flowers of the hairy penstemon. Easy, dependable, and, and I, I'll even get little pups in the garden. It'll reseed. Smooth penstemon is another one that'll reseed in the garden. You'll get free plants here and there. Smooth penstemon is Husker Red. Husker Red was a selection found by Dale Lindgren in Nebraska. So yes, it's got a cultivar name. Husker Red was a, oh, I'm sorry, I love my Huskers, but a poor name for that plant. Because when you get it, you think the flower should be red, right? <laughs> it was named after that red foliage. But I think the trumpet-shaped flowers are gorgeous. It's also called uh, foxglove penstemon because somebody thought it looked like a foxglove. And then there's another species that you have to go outside of the state to the west. This is Rocky Mountain penstemon. And I show this one because Dale Lindgren was a UNL breeder out in the North Platte. And Dale talked about, because I asked him, what is the longest li living penstemon you've had in the garden? And he said the Rocky Mountain penstemon lived in his garden for a solid 18 years. That's unheard of for a penstemon. Usually they'll last two to three years. So you want that reseeding to take place. I think this is down at the Game and Parks headquarters here in town. They're at uh, uh, 33rd and Fair Street here in Lincoln. Is that not a gorgeous flower? Give me a break, right? Oh, I see a Q and A. Uh, maybe not. Nope, nope. I think I, I think I'm caught up. Okay, very good. There was a chat though. Oh, I knew Dale. All right, awesome. Yeah, great guy, Dale. Uh, man, in his honor, when I used to work at the fairgrounds here in Lincoln before it moved, and um, that's where I really was kind of cutting my teeth with these prairie plants, and I wanted to do a demonstration garden that highlighted penstemons. I wanted to do a demonstration garden that highlighted asters, a demonstration garden that highlighted gay feathers. I wanted to be that destination people could come to to see that diversity right under their noses. A couple of new ones that I've recently been uh, planting and playing with and the statewide arboretum has been offering, calico penstemon, uh, penstemon calicosis, and then we have the slender penstemon gracilis, both uh, eastern species, uh, Calicosis, I think it's as close as Minnesota. But what I like about these two is they can take part shade. The other ones I showed you are give me wall to wall sunshine or give me death. But these two say, I'm, I'm perfectly fine in part shade. I'll do just fine in your, the shadow of a tree or maybe it gets a half day, uh, half day of sun and half day of shade. Uh, they do perfectly fine. So uh, consider these two uh, overlooked penstemons for your garden. There's the emerging foliage in the spring, which I think is gorgeous. Oh, and there's the Rocky Mountain penstemon again. This picture, I think, yeah, this picture was taken in Sydney, Nebraska, way out west in the panhandle. There's a close-up of the flower. Is that not sexy? Give me a break. Oh, uh, Missouri primrose. Um, Pretty popular prairie plant back in the 80s and 90s. And it's, I don't see it much in gardens anymore. We have to get back to planting this plant because it's so easy, so tough. Man, it can take the heat. It can take the dry. Maybe you're dealing with a slope and you want to plant something that can live on that slope. Where I see it native in Nebraska, kind of the southern tier counties along Highway 8. Man, it's growing in rocky soil and on a slope. So it can really take it. Those flowers are shoot, they can be four inches across. And they generally bloom in the evening and they'll stay open in the morning and then they close up during the heat of the day, often disappointing a gardener. And I say, get over it, they're worth it. There you see the native range. Yeah, there's that Southern tier counties I was talking about, mainly along Highway 8, always in rocky prairies. So I don't know where it's native up in this county, but my guess is it's a rocky prairie uh, growing up there. Tough, tough plant. Whoops, there you see a close-up of the flower. It's got a cousin called Fremont's Primrose. Maybe you know a little bit about the town of Fremont. Hopefully you do. Fremont was named after John C. Fremont. They even have John C. Fremont days. He was a, a Western explorer, uh, followed up Lewis and Clark in the 1820s, and he cataloged a lot of plants that had not been seen by white people before. So he was sending these back to, as herbarium specimens, the first white dude to 
catalog these plants and they even uh, named it science, scientific name in his honor. So Fremontii. And you'll see, I think he cataloged like 200 different species in that 1820s uh, trek as he headed west from St. Louis across Nebraska in Iowa, Wyoming, Nevada, California. So if you look, uh, Iowa's got a Fremont County. Nebraska has a Fremont County. Wyoming has a Fremont County. Colorado has a Fremont County. So does Nevada and California. Heck, every state named a county after the dude. I think he was, uh, 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 I think he was a lieutenant or something with the, with the military. Anyway, uh, cool plant. You can see a little bit subtle differences. The foliage is more narrow and it's more gray green than it is green. And that's a good indicator of drought tolerance. Plants that have uh, grayish foliage is an indicator to you that they like it high and dry. Think of lamb's ear as being grayish uh, gray, right? Uh, your your, uh, your artemisias, things like that. Here it is in a xeric garden that I grew. Here's a good example to show you what I use for mulch in a xeric garden. Um, no wood chips here. There's a little cactus hiding right there and then a cool rock uh, because I'm a rock hound and that rock is buried halfway in the soil to look like it's been there forever. So you can create these own little scenes right in your own hot, sunny landscape. And this plant is incredibly drought tolerant. This drought we're currently having, I guarantee you, it would just laugh at and say, bring it on. There's a close up of the flower and the foliage, much more fine. So plants that have very fine foliage, i.e. almost needle-like is another indicator. You shouldn't even have to look at the tag is what I'm trying to teach you here is, is you you get a plant at a garden center and has this fine wiry foliage. Think of moonbeam coreopsis. It's pretty common. Very skinny, narrow foliage. Well, the plants reduced the surface area of that foliage, again, to cope with droughty, hot wind, all those conditions that come with the dryland prairie. Pretty cool. Lead plant, another one that has gray-green foliage. Remember what I said about gray green foliage? You, you shouldn't have to even be told about this plant. Oh, it's gray green. That means it's drought tolerant. Yes, it is. Tough, tough plant. It's another one that takes several years to really come into its own. Um, I love the foliage right now. This is what mine looks like at home right now. When it's emerging in the spring, uh, you see that almost white. And if you kind of rub this off, it's actually kind of a, oh, a fuzz, if you will. Uh, covering the leaves, again, keeping the wind from sucking the moisture out of it. The flowers are very impressive. However, they're very fleeting. I mean, the thing probably like blooms for maybe a week, maybe 10 days. I don't know. I never counted, but it doesn't last long. That's the only bad thing, but you've got great cake. So when I look at wildflowers, I want good cake and that's the foliage. This is the icing. So, um, you know, because people often ask me, well, how long does it bloom? I want a plant that blooms from early June all the way till frost. And I tell them that it's like, well, you're going to have to plant a marigold because these prairie plants, you know, especially in a drought year, uh, their bloom time is going to be fleeting. They're not out to please us humans. They're out to please their pollinators. Okay. And this is a good pollinator plant, keystone species. Uh, lovely when it's in flower. Awesome, awesome plant. Sorry to interrupt, but oh, I, no, you're good. I just wanted to um, put out the poll uh, since we've just got a few minutes left in the webinar, if that's okay, sure. but you can keep talking like you have been. It's been very good information. Very good. I'm just going to put this out so people can see it. Um, you should be seeing it now and then go ahead and fill that out. It only takes a few minutes and Bob, you can go ahead and keep sharing. And do you want me to wrap things up at, at, at eight o'clock then? Um, I think that would be good okay. just to make sure people. Um, you got stuff to do tonight, people. You know, I don't people wanna... might have other things to do, but I know we've yeah. all loved listening to you. You've had like such good information. I mentioned that you were an expert at the beginning of this, and it seems like I was right about that. So, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, and again, to me, the, the stuff I'm telling you guys is to help you think of it as a concept rather than trying to memorize everything. 
you know, that's why I'm telling you these little hints about drought tolerance and how, I, to me, it's just kind of cool how plants can do that, right? And and uh, again, I know I'm not going to get done. That's obvious, people. I haven't even gotten to Savannah and Woodland. And I knew it was dangerous when we said, really, you want me to talk about all three in one PowerPoint? And go, <laughs> it's way too big. And get this, the plants I've, I've shown you guys, I don't want to call it the tip of the iceberg, but I kept it simple. There's so many more to choose from, right? And I know it's maybe getting a little overwhelming for the amount of things I'm talking about, but just know this PowerPoint will be available for you to view on your own time. And they can flip through the pictures as fast as you want. Look them up at your own convenience because I encourage you to fall down that rabbit hole and look up these plants. Dwarf lead plant is a cool plant that really is not common at all in gardens. This plant's not native to Nebraska. It's native to the Dakotas, mainly South and North Dakota. But what a cool flower, a little bit different, obviously, than lead plant, and it's fragrant. It's got a really lovely, sweet scent to it, and maybe half the height of lead plant, and the leaves look similar to lead plant. They're not that gray-green that I was showing you, but they're smaller in size. So again, the plant has reduced its surface area to cope with drought. And here it is growing tight with a bunch of prairie grasses and looking very regal. Oh, I see a Q and A on there. Let's see. Ah, <laughs> I am seeing damage on leaves from dicamba containing herbicide spraying on neighboring landscapes. Is there anything I can do? Oh boy, Lisa, you know, yeah, what can we all do, right? All we can do is complain to our lawmakers and say, you know, this is not sustainable the way we're doing with this dicamba herbicide. And really um, prairie plants do suffer from it, but what's suffering the worst, huh, Lillian, will we have a part three? Well, we'll just have to see about that, Lillian. Um, yeah, trees are the ones that are really, really suffering from this, uh, what has become uh, dicamba sprayed fields. Um, you know, once Roundup Ready soybeans and Roundup Ready corn came out where you can just overspray those without worrying about it. Back in the day, we roped corn. Back in the day, we walked beans to get rid of those weeds. Now it's all handled through chemicals. I think we have to get back to that because you give small town kids a job like me. I walked beans for six years, seven years, and it taught me responsibility. It taught me observation. Um, we have to get back to that. But how are we going to change that? Well, you just have to tell the policymakers and maybe they will listen. Well, we can't guarantee that. But isn't that a lovely flower up close? Okay. Now I'm going to look at the time. It's eight o'clock. <laughs> and I'm going to tease you here because, oh, he was just going to talk about the milkweeds. And I wanted to know more about the milkweeds. <laughs> well, we will just have to have a part two, right? I think and, and so. I don't know when we can do that. We, we'll chat about this after that. Yes. Lisa, but uh, um, yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to come back. You know, if you want to do it the heat of summer, you know, everybody's kind of dog days of summer of July and August. We could wait and do it in the fall, and we could just pick up where we left off right here at the milkweeds. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. That sounds good. Yeah, we can definitely talk about that. Obviously, there's a lot more to cover, and I'm sure that there's a lot more that people would like to know. So thank you so much, Bob, for sharing all of that information. It was really informative and well done. Um, I just appreciate you taking the time out of your day to speak with us, and obviously you could keep going, so I wish we could, but um, yeah, this is such an important topic. So thank you to everyone who's here, who's come to learn with us. And as I mentioned, this webinar will be uploaded to our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel in a few weeks. And feel free to also check out our Conservation Nebraska Facebook page for more upcoming events as well. Um, some of them that we mentioned earlier in this webinar. And like I mentioned earlier, um, this PowerPoint will be available as well. So we hope to see you all again in the future. And thank you so much to Bob and everyone who attended. It was a good night. You're, you're welcome. And thank you. And, and I see one more Joanne in the chat. Just go ahead and email that to the statewide Arboretum, Joanne, and, and they'll forward it to me and, and take some pics of that garden so I can look at it. I can't guarantee you I'm going to be able to come and look at the bed. You know, life's busy. 
but uh, I wish I could, <laughs> but uh, we could maybe solve it just, just through some good pictures too, so. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Get out there and get your hands dirty. <laughs> yep. All right. Bye-bye. See you guys.